Hello, everyone. Today we are going to talk about evidence-based practice. So what is evidence-based practice? How do we use evidence-based practice? And how did it develop and why do we need it? So to start, the definition of evidence-based practice is healthcare practices that are led by combining scientific research, clinical experience, and patient preferences. So what does that mean? When we look at the evidence-based practice model, we know that evidence is based on research. It's based on what we have studied, what we know to be true um, based on that. So there are different types of research that we'll talk about eventually throughout the class, but typically it's organized into qualitative research, quantitative research, and mixed me methods. So qualitative research is studying more stories and um, subjective data where quantitative research is looking more at measurements, numbers, and that objective data. Mixed methods combines a little bit of qualitative and quantitative. Clinical experience is combining our practical and theoretical knowledge. So it's looking at our education and training, the experiences that we've had either through our training in healthcare or through our healthcare practices and all that. It's looking at our different resources that are available. You could know the best practice for something, but if you don't have access to the tools and the resources to use that best practice, then you look at what you have and what you can do with making the most out of what's available to you. So that's part of that clinical expertise area. Also, if you've had any mentorship or support, that's going to drive your decisions and what you're able to practice with. As far as patient preferences go, it's a combination of cultural, physical, and emotional needs. So it's looking at their prior experiences. If a patient has had a poor experience with something and they refuse a treatment, um, that is their choice. That's their option. And we have to consider that when we make their care plans and when we look into practicing evidence-based practice. Other patient preferences um, could be dependent on their quality of life, their education, External influences, like if they have family members that have an opinion, um, that's kind of where the cultural preferences may come in. And so we look at all of those different things when we decide the best practice for that patient. And this is what we call evidence-based practice. One thing that we look at as well when we're looking for the evidence in our um, ability to practice is the levels of evidence. And we'll talk about this more when we look into quantitative and qualitative critiques. But what we have here is the evidence pyramid. And so in this pyramid, it tells you the rigor of the evidence. So the higher up on the pyramid you go, the higher quality of evidence and the lower risk of bias that we have. So when we're looking and doing a literature review, we wanna make sure that we're trying to find the best evidence that we can. So the best evidence is going to be your systematic reviews and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. The level down from that is randomized control trials, then cohort studies, case control studies, cross-sectional studies and surveys, case reports and case studies, mechanistic studies, and then editorials or expert opinion. So how do you conduct evidence-based research? So first and foremost, you have to become interested in something. Um, once you find that interest, ask a question about it. In this course and in nursing, we use a PICO or a PICOT question, um, and we'll talk about that in another lecture. But that is a way to form your question to help you best do your literature search. So that is the next step, conducting a search of the best evidence. This uses a lot of different um, databases and looking for different articles. And then after you find all the articles and you've read the articles that you feel are appropriate to your research question, then you appraise the evidence. So that's kind of referring back to that pyramid. We're looking at it and saying, you know, is this a rigorous study? Is this a high quality of evidence? Is the risk of bias low? After we've appraised the evidence, we can apply that appraised evidence to our clinical expertise, our patient preferences, and our values. After we've implemented that practice, we can evaluate the outcomes and then share those results. And that in a nutshell is how we use evidence-based practice in nursing. So why evidence-based practice? We've really seen a revolution 
revolution, a revolution and an evolution of research and healthcare practices um, throughout the history of time. So first and foremost, we have our ancient times. During this, it was a lot of trial and error. So they used a lot of different health practices, not really knowing if it was gonna work or not to see what would happen. So some common practices that we had in ancient times were things like bloodletting, trepanination, which is when they would drill a hole in your skull to let any evil spirits or any bad humors out of your body. They use things like mercury, animal blood, or feces to make different medications. Some cultures resorted to cannibalism. Bathhouses were very common in Greece and Rome. And basically what those were were natural hot springs that they made a structure around and they had things like hot tubs, um, sports, massages, things like that. But people would go to the bathhouses and use that heated mineral water for healing. Um, other things that were common were prayer and exorcisms, as well as sacrifice to the gods. Then we enter the medieval times, and we kind of see a transition from trial and error to the four humors. Treating the four humors did use a lot of the same practices as trial and error, so we did see a lot of um, things like bloodletting or bathhouses still in use during medieval times, but it focused on these different humors. So the theory was that our body was equally composed of four humors. There was your yellow bile, your blood, your black bile, and your phlegm. And if any of those humors were depleted or in excess, it would throw off the other humors and lead to disease. So you had to treat it based on what was going to increase that humor. So for example, yellow bile was considered hot and dry and it was considered originating in the liver. So if anyone was having any liver problems, they would recommend that you go to a hot place or you eat hot and dry foods to increase that yellow bile if you were deficient. If you had excess, like for example with blood, which is considered a hot and wet humor originating in the heart, let's say you had too much blood, then they would do the bloodletting to help balance out those humors. Black bile is considered cold and dry and is said to originate in the spleen. And then phlegm was cold and wet and said to originate in the brain. Then we move into the Crimean War in the times of Florence Nightingale. So Florence Nightingale really took a big leap in creating evidence-based practice. She's known for redefining nursing and kind of establishing nursing for what it was today. But basically what she did is she ran a hospital during the Crimean War and continuing onward. And she really emphasized a lot of different things that we use today, things like defining a person as a holistic being, um, improving access to care, using patient-centered care and advocacy. Another thing, though, that really, really helped to evolve evidence-based practice was she emphasized that your practices should be data-driven. So she is one of the first people that really sat down and took records of her patients and started noticing patterns based on the data, the outcomes, and things like that, so that she could then identify what are going to be best practices to use in her hospital. Shortly after the Crimean War, we have the cholera pandemic. So during the cholera pandemic, or I should say prior to the cholera pandemic, people believed in something called the miasma theory. This theory was that people got sick from bad air or dirty air. Um, in a sense, we know that things can travel in the air and you can get sick from contaminated air, but this was the belief that all sickness came from that. And because of it, we weren't properly treating the cause of many illnesses. So with the cholera pandemic, people started to kind of look at this theory and say, I don't know if this is coming from the air. And basically what they did is they identified a pattern of where people were being infected with cholera and recognized that it was all coming from the same contaminated water source. That's when they decided that maybe you can get sick from things other than the air and they realized that this water was what was causing the disease. Because of that, they were able to shut off that contaminated water source and prevent cholera from spreading. So this was a big shift in using patterns, using data, using um, research to drive new practices. Um, this is also when we started emphasizing improved hygiene as well.
So then this brings us to the world wars. So from the time of the cholera epidemic to the world wars, we see major improvements in medicine technology. We see better improvements in access to healthcare, understanding of disease. And we kind of have moved a little bit more into what we see for modern practices. Um, we've also seen during this time an expansion and development of hospital systems. Um, prior to that, it was a lot more community-based care, home care, and that kind of shifted us to our inpatient-based care. We also see a huge growth of evidence-based practices, access to research, expansion of research. Um, and so it was a really vital time for evidence-based practice. Another thing that we see that came out of the world wars was defining research ethics and parameters, which is really important when we look at how to conduct research and why research is done. And then that brings us to our modern day. Today, we have a big reliance on evidence-based practice, but in truth, studies have shown that it can take anywhere from seven to 17 years for research to translate into practice. So that's a huge gap. That's almost two decades worth of knowing research, but not practicing it in the hospital system or in the healthcare system. And that's why nursing is so fundamental in practicing evidence-based practice and closing that gap. In nursing, we train you guys to know about evidence-based practice so that you can be prepared to implement practices more efficiently and quicker so that we can try and translate evidence into practice way sooner than that seven to 17 year time span. Um, many doctoral and master's prepared nurses are especially trained in how to implement evidence-based practices in the healthcare setting as well, but it is important for nurses overall to know how to find research, how to appraise that research, and how to practice with the best evidence and consideration for the patients and their experiences that we can. So why do we use evidence-based practice? We know that it improves patient outcomes it improves patient safety, and it can improve both patient and staff satisfaction. When we use evidence-based practice, it allows us to practice with more efficient patient-centered care, which ultimately in that improving outcomes more and improving their safety more can decrease their length of stay. In that, when we have our patients that are doing better and having better outcomes and knowing that we're practicing with the best to our ability. It also increases nurses' confidences, their knowledge and decision-making skills, as well as their time management skills. And overall, this can reduce healthcare costs. So evidence-based practice is super important, and it's really a skill that um, is going to be helpful in your nursing careers, as well as improving the overall health of society.